He will be speaking about uh, orbital anisotropy in condo less material systems. Okay, thanks very much. Thank uh, you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers, especially Carol, for inviting me over here and give me this opportunity to show some of my, my data here. Like he said, my name is Ricardo Urbano. I work at Unicamp, and I mostly do resonance, magnetic resonance experiments. So it's gonna be an experimental talk right now, okay? So I hope I can convince you by the end of this talk that orbital anisotropy in condo lattice materials is very important. It's been very neglected for many years, but recently it's more and more coming that this kind of thing is very important, although the tiny energy scale in these materials. So I'm going to be talking about heavy fermion superconductors. The previous talk uh, mentioned some of them, and uh, very nice talk and made a very good review about all of them. I'm going to focus in one of them here. But before, I would like to show you this plot here where I related many, some of PCs for many compounds, the, the metals, the BCS superconductors along, né, along the years here. Then the serum-based superconductors, oops, then the very important class of materials, the cuprates, high TC cuprates here, just by the 80s, discovered. And then the heavy fermion superconductors that lie right here in this, this graph here. So we have the iron nictides, and lately the sulfur hydrides, high temperature, room temperature superconductors, all right? So I'll be focused mainly in the 115 materials in this, in this graph here. So they are non-BCS, so unconventional superconductors, as mentioned here. And the very first one was first discovered long time ago, late 70s here the Max Planck Institute by Professor Frank Staglish. So this, this class of materials relates a very intriguing physics here, usually antiferromagnetic as a ground state, and superconductivity shows up in the verge of this magnetism, and also displaying some quantum criticality in between these two here with some non-fermion liquid behavior, all right? So just in the last conference, this CAS conference, strongly correlated electron system conference, there was almost the whole section just talking about uranium ditelluride recently discovered. It's also heavy fermion materials. And they claim, they claim that that's going to be the first spin triplet superconductors, just to point out and complete this whole picture here, all right? So the greatest question in these materials is, is how the transition metal, usually in this, this matrix here, changes the hybridization, the 4F serum 4F hybridization, and then the ground state in these materials. As we can see here in the space diagram, there are many ground states and some coexistence between of them. And in principle, it's very complex. And usually, by applying pressure or changing some other control parameters, there's, here is doping, here is pressure. Sometimes it's field, magnetic field, as I'm going to show you. Uh, we find interesting things in these materials. Serum indium-3 is a very simple one that under pressure uh, display superconductivity, again, by the urge, uh, at the 
the verge of this magnetism here and with quantum criticality. From the theoretical point of view, the models often assume that the pressure or doping or any control parameter here will modify the wave function overlap. The 4F, the 4F wave function with the conduction electron bands. And then it's gonna change the degrees of freedom of this problem. However, Detailed information about this hybridization is not so simple in theory because it's a condor lattice material and there's no closed or no uh, well-established uh, theory for that, right? So it requires very complex calculations or indirect experimental analysis, which is again very difficult. Just to mention something here, it's Usually neutron diffraction is a very reliable technique, but indium absorbs a lot of the neutrons, so it's, it's almost impossible to do neutrons measurements here. So in the following, I'm gonna flash some slides with uh, some man finds by NMR. That's usually not very common to see somewhere. And uh, then I'm gonna focus in this uh, crystal field and orbital anisotropy by the half, last half part of this talk. So I'm not, I don't have time to go into details in all this, but I hope just to provide you some background in what's been observed for this special class of materials here. Starting with cobalt, I had to mention the FFLO state. This guy was, in the past, was uh, a very, a very claim to display this inhomogeneous superconducting state, deep inside here, the, the, the superconducting transition. And what we did here was to do an MR and try to probe whether this FFLO was there or not. So it requires very complex experiments, millikelvin temperature, dual fridge, and so on, and relatively high magnetic field. But we managed to find some very special features here. For example, when we apply field in plane here, cerium indium plane, what we found is a crossover of the lines, indium one and indium two. There are two different sites here. And actually, we probed this transition. It is there. But as far as the FFLO, we couldn't say much, but we did observe a field induced magnetism deep inside the superconducting state. So that was the first time someone just uh, could show that magnetism actually coexists microscopically with uh, superconductivity in this phase here. Scott, yeah. What is the color scale shown? Here is paramagnetic and here is TC. Down here is the superconducting state. And the other line here is the transition they were claiming as FFLO transition. What is Oh, this is specific heat measurement. So that's the other, and you see the humps. And so this was very well described in few reports we've done. So, and the question after that is, uh, is whether this FFLO regime would be there even when we dope the materials. So we start looking into, into doping these materials with the cadmium and tin at the indium site and try to see what happens. And here's what summarized what we found there. Tin doping just suppressed TC monotonically. That's just pair breaking. And when we dope with cadmium, this is very interesting case here because it's whole doping, as we can see here. And superconductivity actually gives way to magnetism, 
with a just couple of percent doping level here. One percent doping level, we found magnetism already, which was very, very difficult to, to understand here. So people were used to look at the Doniac phase diagram and look at this magnetism, superconductivity, and kind of try to explain using uh, condo and RKKY interactions. Especially David Pines that would like to, uh, was using a lot his two fluid models. I don't know how many of you are aware of that. But the two fluid model considers one part localized and one part itinerant in this system. But he was not okay with the local scenario we were trying to propose here. And that's what I'm gonna try to convince you. So by doing NMR, what we probe is very local features, right? And we claimed that when you dope the material with cadmium, you introduce a seed there, a magnetic seed, which has some sort of magnetic correlations. So it's an electronic inhomogeneity in the system. And where you have the cadmium there, you have some sort of fluctuations, which upon cooling down the system, this correlation function grows and eventually overlaps at Tineo. So this, this scenario explains sort of the droplet scenario or puddles, whatever you wanna call this. So this would give a very, very feasible explanation for just 1% doping, breaking superconductivity and creating some magnetism there. Exactly, they didn't like me to say that, but yes, that's what we saw. It is phase separated, but when you look at the rhodium under pressure, you get very similar phase diagram here. Well, you take the serum rhodium five, that's just magnetic. By applying pressure, you find superconductivity. Here we did the opposite, we doped and we found magnetism towards the left side here. So there was a question now, what if, what happens here if we apply pressure? We will get back to this side and how to explain the data in this case. There is a reversibility scenario, doping pressure. In. So anyway, we did some pressure measurements in this system. We picked this 1% sample here, apply a pressure. And what we found here was exactly the opposite. Actually, pressure makes harder to form these magnetic puddles and explain really well this inhomogene inhomogeneous scenario and the very low doping just changing between different ground states here. So later on, or more recently, uh, we look into this uh, serum rhodium 5, but now at ultra high magnetic fields. Just recently, it was found a very interesting anomaly deep inside here in the phase diagram temperature versus magnetic field. At 30 Tesla, resistivity measurements showed some kind of anomaly there. They claimed nematicity, all kinds of weird things, but there was an interesting question about this phase here, whether it was uh, another magnetic phase, but in a large firm surface. So we did some NMR at the NHMFL in Tallahassee using the hybrid system, 45 Tesla. I don't go into details here. The spectrum is quite complicated here, but we showed that we also saw this, this anomaly there, so it's real. There is something going on at 30 Tesla. This is night shift measurements. And we provided the first microscope evidence for this. So this is, this is true, actually. And within a framework for a condo lattice, just RKKY, crystal field, and Zeeman interaction, we claimed, and by the end of this talk, I'm gonna go back to this one, but 
at that time, we claim it, we saw some higher hybridization between the serum 4 f electrons and the conduction electrons. And then higher itinerance of the carriers for B over B star in this phase here. So that's, we report that data and let's, let's get back to this by the end of this talk. So despite of this anomaly here, very recent DHVA measurements just show it by the analysis of the frequency here that nothing changes crossing this line here. And they claim that the serum 4 f electrons actually remain localized over the whole field range and rule out any significant firm surface reconstruction. Some people really believe there is a reconstruction of the firm surface here mostly because when you have this transition at 30, this quantum critical point is going to be itinerant. But half of the community actually disagree with that. So it's still an open question here. Anyway, we've been looking into this for a long time, and we believe that crystal field is very important. But only recently, the group of Andrea Severin was looking into this by, by X-ray, actually, because, like I said, neutrons is really hard to do in these materials. But what they saw is that, uh, well, I, I flash here this crystal field. I don't think this audience needs, needs this detail here. But what they saw is that the J5 have, has multiplet here, actually split into three Kramers doublets, namely gamma 7 plus gamma 7 minus and gamma 6. So for all these samples, uh, at, at least for the pure compounds, they claim that the ground state actually is gamma 7 minus. There was a big debate on that. We didn't know some time ago if it was gamma 7 plus or minus. Now we know based on this comparison here with the uh, non-resonant in elastic X-ray scattering data. So we know that's gamma 7 minus. But all of these raise the question about the role of crystal field, crystal electric field in these materials on top of condo and RKQ interactions. Is that important? The energy scale is so, so is smaller. This is like only a few milli-electron volts. But I'm going to show you that's very important. So. From now on, I'm going to show you some NMR data in these materials. We measured the NMR night shift at two different sites. Engine 1, what, that's the engine in plane with serum. And engine 2 is the engine out of plane. For several samples, crossing out this phase diagram here. And combining this result with magnetic susceptibility, I hope to convince you that we can probe the 4F ground state wave functions, the orbital and isotropy of that, and provide some 4F 5P hybridization in detail. So let's just recall that the ground state here is, is this shape. It makes five halves with three halves like that, and there's something in between. An alpha parameter is the, the, the weight of this five half character here, okay? So here I present some of the spectra we found for all these materials, serum rhodium alloyed with iridium. And as you can see here, it's very complicated, so many peaks. Oops. But actually, we can identify all of them by fitting this data, as you can see here, the green line and the magenta line here fits these two different sites. So for those of you not used to this, this is the nuclear Hamiltonian, spin, uh, nuclear spin Hamiltonian, where we have the Zeeman plus hyperfine interaction condensed here, and also quadrupolar interaction, which splits the line like that. So when the field is along C direction, you have uh, um, a weak, equally spaced or split 
spectrum like that for the engine one site. So we have nine transitions for each site there, engine site. However, when you apply fielding plane, things change and there is an anisotropy parameter here, a symmetry parameter here, eta, that's gonna overlap many of the lines. But what's important here is that we can trace, we can track some, any of these transitions. And if we look at this one here for the engine one and some for the engine two, we can get uh, the T dependence of this spectrum. Before, I would like to show you and talk a little bit about this parameter here, this K parameter that we call night shift. For those of you not aware or not uh, in the area, I'm gonna show you how it appears here. Actually, we mix these two interactions, Zeeman and Hyperfine. So an effective field appears here, and then we call it as one plus K times the magnetic field, external field. And what K means exactly here, physically? So whenever you have an electronic spin here, it's gonna polarize the nuclear spin in, in the atom there, in the ion. In this case, it's more complicated, actually, because the spin from serum also influences here or polarizes the nuclear spin at the engine site. So we call this as transferred hyperfine coupling. And for completeness, we call instead of A that's in the same uh, nuclear or atom, we call this as B here. And we have this relation between night shift and spin suitability. It's proportional to the hyperfine constant coupling. And this is exactly what shifts the line when you change temperature, go down in temperature, for example. You see that the line just shifting. So here's the magnetic suitability of some of them. And it is mostly, this, this signal here comes mostly from the 4F electrons, serum 4F electrons. And the solid lines here are fittings using a very simple model, just a mean field model, considering RKKY interaction, crystal electric field, and Zima. This was a, a model made sometime in the past. It was part of that, so it's published here. And by doing this and fitting this magnetization, we get all these crystal field parameters. And in particular, alpha, alpha squared here. That's the, the contribution for the five halves orbital, okay? And these values here we found is in very good agreement with the X-ray diffraction measurements, which is here in, in, in parentheses. We get very close, surprisingly very close numbers here. But here's what we do. Experimentalists like to do simple things. If we plot now night shift against, super, uh, against susceptibility, this is the clauston jacarino relation. We find, uh, usually, we find a linear behavior between them. And this is related to this equation, where night shift is night shift spin contribution and temperature dependent part, and the orbital or chemis, chemical shift here, that actually is the best way to measure spin suitability because do, by doing this, you actually filter all contributions that's not so important to the suitability, and you get just this spin contribution there. So from the linear coefficient here, we have all these contributions. But when we look at the slope of this linear behavior, we get that hyperfine coupling constant directly from experiment, just comparing night shift with the spin suitability. So simple as that. So 
So we did this, we plot all this uh, for the samples we measured here. So of course, at some point here, there is condo interaction kicking in, kick, that kicks in, so it deviates from the linear behavior. But we can always uh, address this behavior, the linear behavior uh, for all these samples, and with that, get all these hyperfine coupling constant. Oh, shit. Okay, faster. So that's what I have here. B1 is the hyperfine constant coupling for engine one side, and B2 for the other side. And surprisingly here, we found a straight line if we plot the hyperfine coupling against the alpha, the crystal light field parameter there. Very straight line and, and beautiful behavior here. Of course, if you look at, it, at the other, oops, at the other uh, side is the opposite, right? So how to understand this now? with some drawings here. B1, that's the hyperfine hyper coupling constant at the engine one side. Now I change the origin of the crystal structure here. So I place the serum in the center. Engine one is the red ones, and engine two are the, the green ones. So what happens here is B1 grows over this range. We studied, and with increasing alpha square. So what actually happens here is the orbital is changing its shape and becoming more oblate here. So we can summarize that as a change in the orbital there, like so. So if we look at the, the structure by itself, we can see that the, the, the way to have a higher hybridization actually improves when we have that hybridization between serum and engine one side, all right? So like I said, in contrast with the other one, it's the opposite. If you get this, the hybridization with engine one, engine two out of the plane is going to be lower, of course. And that's not only the beauty here, but we can now, believing this linear scaling here, explore uh, extreme experimental conditions, such as pressure and high fuse, like I mentioned in the beginning. So if you look at the pressure data, this was provided by a Nikuru uh, group here. We placed on top of this line data for serum road in your five under pressure. And was shocking how this behaves really nice in this straight line. So just to remember, some of you who know that, serum cobalt in U5, like I show, is just superconducting, but rhodium upon pressure also displays superconductivity. And if you apply about two gigapascal of pressure here, we can have similar superconducting regimes for both samples, and this is exactly what we see here. Apply pressure in rhodium, about two gigapascal, we recover exactly what we see for cobalt in this uh, linear scaling here. So then we can infer some sort of uh, pressure dependence for the alpha parameter as well. So the results here imply that the pressure changes the crystal field parameter and actually now creates an orbital that's it's, it favors hybridization out of plane here. And this is very important because we know for these materials that we need that hybridization to get to superconductivity. So we don't want hybridization in plane for superconductivity. We need out of plane. So this is very important result. Anyway, uh, just to finish here my, my discussion, Let's look at the high field data that I showed you in the beginning. And, oh, too fast. Remember this phase diagram. If we look at this uh, night shift data, we can also get the alpha value according to this linear behavior. And if we believe in this 
we now can say and provide another uh, piece of information here that the hybridization actually is improved, actually is improved in plane here with, between serum and indium one sites. So with that, I kind of rushed a little, but that's fine. I will summary these main findings here. Just recalling that we did measure night shift and magnetic suitability. And I hope I could show you in a very simple way that just by doing experiments, we can get very important um, results here in this system. And most, of, uh, most importantly, importantly, we found this linear behavior. This actually uh, is the way we have this behavior here, B1, this hyperfine coupling at indium one side is directly proportional to alpha and field as well, but B2 and pressure is opposite. So this explains the hyperfine coupling is enhanced, as I just mentioned, and at the engine two side actually decreases. But this is actually a direct proof that this hybridization between the 4F wave functions and 5P orbitals, it is controlled by orbital anisotropy, like in the title of this talk. And more than that, offers an explanation for the abrupt decrease in the night shift that I just showed you at 30 Tesla, and the pressure dependence, as I just showed you, for the serum road in U5. The question now we are trying to answer is if this is scaling, this linear scaling is, would be universal for any other serum-based superconductors or not. So I just would like to thank my collaborators in this work here, uh, Paulo, Guilherme, and Davi, my PhD students. Paulo did most of these uh, last measurements here. And Pascal and Jean, Jean is his student. Pascal Palius is the one growing samples and also collaborating with discussions and all this in our group. But also the, the Nicholas Kuro group at UC Davis that provided us this pressure data I just showed you. And also they received Paulo for some of these measurements as a sandwich over there. That's it, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thanks, Ricardo, for this Thank you. very nice talk, uh, precisely on time. We are <laughs> open for questions. Let's start over here. Uh, thanks for the talk, very interesting. I, there were also some recent ultrasound measurements that claimed that the 30 Tesla transition in cerium rhodium indium 5, that there was another transition at 20 and that it went from incommensurate to commensurate to incommensurate antiferromagnetism. How does this fit with this picture? Is it, does it fit there? I mean, it's... Let me try to show you. Yeah, we, we didn't see any incommensurability, but we measured with, with field along C direction. Yeah. Uh, but we did see some canting of the moments. Uh, let me show you the structure there. Oosh, maybe here. I prefer to go here because I don't see anything. I cannot see. Sorry. I mean, I can imagine that some changing of the orbitals can affect that, but I wondered if you had any Yes, insight. well, the orbital yeah. does change yeah, there. Sure, I just showed Does this it. relate then to the change but of the But we should track this uh, for many points actually. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, it's true. There are a bunch of uh, experimental data there. I don't understand that the HVA that says they don't see any change there. Maybe magnetization is not so simple. No, to I, do. this was my data. It's very simple. It's your data? Yeah, the, the DHVA is really clear. There's no change in the Fermi. So system. you don't see any change yeah. there? Nothing at all. No. That's interesting. Yeah. But these people claim that it's first order transition, right? And nematic, I, I didn't see any nematicity there. Yeah. But yes. So uh, the ultrasound was a kind of a check to see what was happening at, at 
30 Tesla. And, and uh -huh. then by analyzing the elastic constants, it, um, it showed that the antiferromagnetism changed. Over here, I get, oh, one more. Here. So we saw this canting, but we measure only with field along C. Yeah. Because remember that I said when we apply field in plane, we start seeing actually another two different sites for Indian 2. Because now you have the hyperfine coupling, one parallel and the other one. So if you field in plane along A, you have the Indian 2 and the B. Yeah. Now you have three sites. And then all the spectra would be a big mass. So we decided just to measure along C because we had one shot. Four days measurement yeah, only. <sighs> Millikelvin and 40 Tesla, not so simple. And they told me, you are spending $2,000 per minute. So <laughs> rush. Yeah, I don't believe How that. can you do? How can you take a measurement like that? Anyway, that's the way it is, right? But I, I, I'm going to look into this uh, ultrasound data yeah. more carefully. Is it right yeah, with the orbital. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ricardo. It was a very, very nice talk. Thank you. I was wondering if you have any idea about the crystal fields in the plutonium 115 compounds and what is the relation with the TC? Well, that's a good question. Yeah, plutonium has a, a, very, it's a very high temperature, right, for these materials. And it's something I suggested Nick to do because it's classified somehow, right? Not classified, but he was the one doing that. I couldn't touch plutonium samples Probably by the time. Of, yes, <laughs> see? But yes, I, I convinced him to provide me with the pressure data, old pressure data, actually. And it was, was surprising how it was in this line. And the question is, it's a good suggestion. I'm going to ask him to, to use this scale. And I don't know. It's a, it's a good way to. John Sorrell now talks to people over there, right? Not reachable, I guess. He's no longer in the lab or something. Other questions? OK, I, I will ask one question. Sure. As Walbert there to change to plutonium, <laughs> I will change to uranium. Uranium. Which is less dramatic than plutonium. So there is, uh, I, I am ashamed to ask this question because I should know the answer. I have been working on uranium ruthenium 2 silicon 2 also for a long time. Me too. <laughs> uh, so I was wondering if uh, there are any more measurements that, so, so uranium ruthenium 2 silicon 2 is the famous hidden order compound. Yeah. And it has a very complex phase diagram. No matter what thing you change, pressure, uh, uh, doping, magnetic field, you go through very different phase transitions. Are there any more measurements showing changes in the uranium 5F conduction band electron hybridization uh, across the different phases? Yeah, well, I also did some measurements mm -hmm. uh, with uh, the people in Japan, mm -hmm. my collaborators in Japan in uranium ruthenium 2 silicon 2. It's with very complicated. With Diaoki? Diaoki, Diaoki did other measurements. Grenoble, and, but with uh, Shin, okay. Kanbei, and Hiro, mm -hmm. Hiro Nori Sakai. We actually went to, to the hybrid system and did the measurements there. Mm -hmm. uh, well, my dosh claimed this octopole stuff and all kinds of weird things. Uh, like you said, the, the structure is, is a little different. It's more like the iron wire tonight. And we look at this silicon at the arsenic site there. And it had to be enriched sample because silicon has just a minor signal there. And we found, actually, we tried to map the, the magnetic structure. And, and it's not simple. Mm -hmm. But at that time, we didn't have this uh, knowledge about the orbitals. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's something to look at. But if you believe this octopus, I, I don't believe in the... You see, then how is going to be just a ball, right? 
the orbital is going to be just a sphere. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. So maybe that's worth looking at. Yeah, it's, it's something to revisit. Like I said, that's like the last question in my conclusion. Mm -hmm. Is that going to hold for other mm -hmm. Fermi? Mm -hmm. I can't answer actually this. We just look at uh, David, my student, did uh, finish his uh, master degree in serum 112, serum bismuth. Serum copper bismuth 2. Mm -hmm. That's another heavy fermion. And in this case, we look at the copper side. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, copper is not so hybridized with a serum. So it's not a good NMR probe for us. That was a good answer to Pasquale that started to dope the, the bismuth side, not the copper side, with gold and other stuff. He, he did. But like I said, it's not. The hybridization is not that strong, so we don't see much going on, just a time chain. But it's something going on right now. So if it holds for these other heavy fermions, there is a chance we can apply for many others. Okay. Hopefully. Because it's a very simple way. To, well, this, the experiment is not so simple. <laughs> and we don't have uh, manpower right now, but yeah. I hope to convince guys there to look for NMR and at least for superconductivity is very important. Like I mentioned there, uranium ditelluride is claiming to be spin triplet superconductors and the only probe that says that with no doubt is NMR. Mm -hmm. When you look at night shift, if a spin wave just go, mm -hmm. it doesn't see TC, just go. Mm -hmm. The line never shifts. And that's the evidence for this. So I don't know if people are doing that. I'm late on that. OK. Um, in the meantime, some questions now arise. OK. If not, thanks for coming. Thank you again. very much. Yeah. Thank you.